perspectives, different aspects of open science, uh, and it's uh, quite interesting. So I, I invite you to, of course, go and read all the articles. We were not able to convene all the authors here today, but we are pleased to have with us four of them who, are, who have accepted uh, to come on board who are representing different regions and different perspectives in their articles, and they will develop uh, that in, in the discussion that we are going to ha have. Before we move to this uh, round the table, uh, I just wanted to explain as well that we chose this topic for IAU Horizons in light of the fact that UNESCO uh, is currently working on a, a new normative instrument in form of a draft recommendation of open science, which also represents a global commitment and trying to generate a, a global understanding of open science. So before we go to the round the table, I would like to give the floor to Fernanda Began, because beyond being the principal researcher at CONICET, the National Scientific and Technical Research Council in Argentina and head professor at National University of Cuyo. She's also the chair of the advisory committee on open science, a committee that was established for the drafting of the UNESCO recommendation on open science. Fernanda, you have the floor to give us some information about where we stand with regards to this recommendation. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank you, Trini and Hans, for, for this opportunity. And first of all, I would like to know if you're looking at my screen, because you know that's always the, the main issue at the beginning. OK, then thank you very much. I, as you were saying, Trini, I was the chair of the advisory committee for the UNESCO recommendation, and we worked all 2020 on this. And, and we have some news about it. And so in very few minutes, I would like to tell you about this. As you were saying, at the beginning of 2020, the process at UNESCO started with a set of different consultations and the confirmation of this advisory committee with representatives from all regions, from the six regions that are part of UNESCO. And the idea, as you all know, of course, is that open science with all the different aspects it, it entails, it was addressed, the, the recommendation was addressed to the importance of open science to fulfill the human right to science and, and to leave no one behind in regard to the access to science and its benefits. And so the potential of open science in, democratic, in democratizing the knowledge and reducing the inequalities between and within countries was a permanent uh, concern for this advisory committee and for the UNESCO. And so the first draft of the recommendation was developed during 2020 based on three major inputs. First of all, the global regional thematic consultations that were made in different regions of the world and with stakeholders and with experts and the surveys, the global survey that was developed also between March and May 2020. Of course, uh, under the guidance of this UNESCO International Advisory Committee that had the opportunity to chair and, and was really composed with experts in the different areas that are part of the open science and with the support of the UNESCO Intersector Task Team. This first draft was submitted to UNESCO member states on the 30th of September last year. And after that, we received comments from the different member states. We received uh, comments and inputs from different stakeholders to the first draft. And the new second draft was submitted this last March 30th. And so the revised draft was discussed at the Intergovernmental Special Committee meeting, where the representatives of the, of the state members discussed in an open and fair deliberation. And the many positions and the broad consensus were achieved based on the second draft. I can say that the second draft didn't uh, suffer major, major transformations because really there was a general consensus on many of the issues, but there were a lot of positions and consensus that, that had to be made on, on some of the parts of this text. And finally, it was approved on May 11th by this committee. And so we think that we are in the, in the path to its approval in the next conference in November in the 41st session. So if you want to see how the schedule goes, you can see uh, there in, in, in light uh, pink that this meeting that was held in May is 
the, the last and final step in order to submit the draft to the 41st, 41st conference in November. And we are really looking forward to its adaptation in November, next November. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fernanda, for, uh, for introducing this. I think this is an important context because it is really an initiative that shows that there is starting to be a, a global uh, movement and a global common understanding and global ambitions in terms of the, the directions that we want to take uh, moving open science forward. And this is also the topic uh, of today. So I think that we can now move to the, the round the table. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you, first of all, Anja, Anja Smith, who is the university librarian at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And uh, I think that you play a very essential role in the implementation of the university's open science strategy. I think as well that the Netherlands is one of the countries in the world that is quite advanced uh, in terms of open science, as there is an open science strategy set at the national level and supported by the national government. So we look forward to hearing from you, Anja, on your experience and your advice on the way forward. Thank you so much, uh, Katrina, and thank you so much for the invitation to this wonderful event. Open science cannot be anything if it's not global. <laughs> so I'm really delighted to be here um, um, virtually in a wonderful setting with people from all over the world. Um, it is really um, uh, an honor and, um, and, and an opportunity to, to have a discussion from, from so many angles and, and experiences. Um, as Trina said, the Netherlands um, have, um, have had open science on, on, its, on their agenda for a couple of years now. Um, of course, um, um, I'm, I'm certain that it's true that all over the world, libraries have started the discussion about open access 20 years ago, um, and it culminated into an open science agenda in different parts of the world. Of course, open access, open access to uh, research results is a library mission. A, a library cannot have another mission than to further access to, um, to publications and, and research results. So it's only natural for a librarian like me to be uh, closely involved. Um, in 2018, I took the initiative together with a researcher uh, a prominent um, social sciences researcher, Chantal Kellner, to ask the University of Utrecht, where I work, to implement and start a program um, of open science. Um, so that's much broader than just open access. Open science in my university, uh, um, uh, this is also the national agenda, consists of open access, fair, research data, rewards and incentives to really start to try to get away from impact factors um, as an assessment system for, for researchers and also public engagement. Sometimes this is called citizen science, but um, this, these are the four pillars that, that we use. Why did I take that initiative? I thought if the rewards and incentive system uh, does not change, open access will never be able to develop. So we need a program where the university works on different areas uh, to change in order to um, um, develop open and transparent access to research results, not only publications, but also research data. So we're now in, in the stage where the university is, is implementing uh, this, this program. And uh, um, I'm, I'm back to, to the library's um, um, topic of open access. Um, I think in, in um, the, the digitization of, of many aspects of university uh, processes and work, of course, is an, an, an important incentive for open science, but really open science is about 
uh, you know, what you said, democratizing research, but also um, sometimes um, somebody says that it's a new contract of research and scholarship with the, um, with the uh, uh, community, with the world. Um, so with this respect, in this respect, developing open science and open science practices is a co-creation. It cannot be anything else. It is at the center, the research community, the researchers themselves are in the, in the lead, I think. They should be. It's their transformation. It's how they are changing their, their work. At the same time, you also need um, uh, policymakers to make new policies. You need support, for example, from the library, but also from IT services. You need um, incentives from uh, research funders. In the Netherlands, we are a very small country, of course. Our national government was, um, was very um, um, uh, important for setting, uh, putting open science on the national agenda of our government. You need laws, you need infrastructure, so all these areas, you need players to come along and, and play. At different times in the process, you need different um, people in the lead. <laughs> At this moment in the Netherlands, we, we focus very much on research rewards and incentives, which is very um, um, difficult because um, it is all about not using impact factors anymore to assess the quality of research and researchers. But what we see happening in the university is that many people think, oh, this is an HR issue. So now it's taken into, um, all, it's, it's put on the agenda of HR. But of course, um, impact factors has something to do with the publishing world has something to do with how researchers, the international community of research, assess their own work. Um, so it's much more than HR. Um, still, uh, you need all these discussions uh, about developing towards a more open and transparent research, um, research results. What we, what we, I said um, it's important that um, open science can only be seen as a global issue. I do not believe in local open access. That is not open access. It's everybody, it should include everyone, and the same goes for open science. Uh, this is um, not easy because I'm not even sure if we have a global vision. We all have maybe a different perception and, and, and images of what open science should be depending on where we live and, and how our circumstances are. So um, are we uh, together um, moving towards the same target? <laughs> That's even a question on, on the, the level of the vision maybe. That's also why it's so important that um, organizations like UNESCO are involved to align the, 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 um, um, the discussion about the vision so that we can align our, our vision so that when we start implementing and changing habits um, that we still have the same goal that we work collaboratively uh, towards. I'm sure that in, in the practices we will implement open science differently. Um, in the Netherlands, um, for the last few years, we have worked with publishers to create open access for the, the Dutch research results. That is not the only path that you can take, and I'm sure that we want to change our method uh, also for the next few years and, and work much more in the area of green open access, for example. This will change depending on the world. Maybe also um, the assessment systems will, will be different in different parts of the world, etc. Um, despite the differences, um, it's very important to build a, a shared vision. And I'm very happy that um, by um, taking part in this discussion, we might hope 
um, that process a little bit along. Thank you, that's from me. Thank you very much, uh, Anya, for, for sharing the, the, the experience that you have lived on, on your side from, from the Nether Netherlands. And I think that you're already mentioning a lot of uh, important aspects. And I think that we also saw across uh, many of the articles, which was interesting because the, it was not really uh, linked to a specific uh, region. There were many issues that actually were very similar uh, across the different regions. So I think that you, you touch on a, an important point as well when you say that, that open science is not something that you can only pursue at the, at the national level. It's a, it's, it's a global ambition and we need uh, collaboration for it to happen. And we, of course, need the diversity that comes from, from different contexts uh, and countries. But that is what we are trying to, to foster as well here at IAU, the, the dialogue and uh, having exchanges in order to, to discuss how we move forward. So thank you already for your presentation. We are now going to move to Africa, where we are very pleased to have with us uh, Wundwuthen Tamrat who is the president of St. Mary's University in Ethiopia. Um, you mentioned as well in, in, in the article that um, um, some of the, the, the momentum of open science is due to the fact uh, that we have new digital tools that allows us to collaborate, to share data and information in, in different uh, ways. Uh, in Africa, that is not always uh, something that can be taken for granted. Yet you you highlight uh, Tamrat, uh, Professor Tamrat, that uh, in Ethiopia you have seen uh, quite a lot of progress still. So we look forward to to hearing uh, from your perspective on uh, the situation and your thoughts about the future. Thank you very much, Troy, and uh, thank you, Boston and uh, IAU, for the opportunity. I'm glad to be uh, able uh, to uh, represent my region, specifically my country, in terms of the new developments, challenges, and uh, specific opportunities we have. Uh, I think I would, I would uh, like to start by emphasizing the point that uh, when it comes to open science, uh, the African continent is where you have both the demand, the challenges very highly prominent. Uh, I, I think the, the advantage that open science would provide Africa in terms of uh, solving many of its research challenges being on the receiving end, uh, strengthening its uh, education and science programs, enhancing its uh, economic development, and uh, increasing visibility of the continent is, is, is clear. But despite all these uh, prominent uh, needs and demands, uh, as many of you might possibly understand, uh, the continent uh, is uh, uh, you know, known for its limited uh, participation uh, in the open science. Uh, but there are encouraging moves here and there, especially in the English speaking Sub-Saharan Africa, where we are beginning to see fundamental changes, which, which are quite uh, encouraging, I would say. Uh, despite the fact that open access is a relatively recent movement in the continent, uh, and the same in, in, in Ethiopia, there are certain developments that uh, I would like to share with you uh, in terms of what's, what's happening. I would like to, to start with the specific ones, specific ones related to the creation of uh, institutional repositories and research networks uh, specific to open access uh, uh, publishing platforms. And then I'll move on to the enabling environments and the policy environment as suggested by Trine. Uh, with regard to the creation of infrastructure, there are uh, lots of attempts, especially in the last decade and a half, to create conditions whereby uh, infra the infrastructure is made available to institutions, to researchers, uh, to ensure that uh, whatever they do uh, is made uh, openly accessible. Uh, at a national level, we have what we call the National Digital Repository of Ethiopia, uh, uh, NADRE. Uh, the initiative was started in 2007. The main aim was uh, 
to create an open access uh, repository at a national level. Uh, today, we have reached at a level where uh, this uh, has been made available for all universities. But in terms of achievements, we still have a long way to go. We have only 13 public universities which are part of this uh, national uh, digital repository and only uh, four have made you know their their outputs uh, openly available so we'll talk about the challenges why this is this is happening we have also what we call the ethiopian education and research network a uh, very uh, broad framework and infrastructure uh, an ICT infrastructure whereby uh, many similar uh, resources were supposed to be openly uh, available this was actually conceived by the government as a capacity building uh, instrument uh, with regard to the education sector. Uh, the government also had other uh, platforms which it calls school aid, waradanit, which are more into the schools and the administrative divisions of, of the country. Now, the creation of this infrastructure, uh, which has encouraged institutions and researchers to be part of it, has also included some capacity building efforts in terms of uh, uh, training uh, offered to repository managers, journal editors, and, and researchers as well. Uh, though there is always this limitation in terms of how much this uh, could have covered. Now, in terms of publishing platforms, open access platforms, uh, the Ethiopian uh, government and the education sector has been able to create what it calls the Ethiopian Journals Online. Uh, this was launched in 2014. Uh, it started with six journals. Now we have uh, 34 uh, journals from 10 universities. Uh, almost all of their publications are available, but 34 journals in Ethiopia means uh, way below uh, half of the journals available in the country. So you can imagine uh, that the platform is there, but how much we have utilized it is uh, still a question. Um, another uh, regional uh, online platform, which many of you might be aware of, is the African Journals Online, uh, which hosts around 526 journals uh, from 32 countries. But uh, it remains that only 20, 256 are open access journals. Ethiopia has 30 of its journals uh, in this African journals online. And it comes next to Nigeria and uh, South Africa, uh, the third uh, contributing country. But still only a handful of uh, the journals are uh, available, uh, are fully uh, open access. So these are more into the specific efforts which are coming up uh, within the higher education sector uh, mainly uh, and within the uh, research ecosystem. But uh, what's more promising as Trin was suggesting is that the current uh, government is giving more attention to uh, the issue of ICT and the issue of uh, digitalization which I would call is more into the enabling uh, environment. Uh, to begin with, the expansion, the higher education system, uh, uh, the expansion that has been going on over the last two years has put a lot of demand on uh, uh, open access. Uh, now we have uh, around 51 public universities, nearly 300 private universities, uh, with uh, more than a million students uh, who for lack of resources, uh, openly uh, demand and opt for open access. So it's a serious demand in terms of the needs of, of, of students, uh, the needs of researchers and the needs of uh, teachers as well. Uh, so though the higher education uh, expansion is positively viewed, it has also at the same time uh, brought this challenge in terms of how much materials will be available and open access comes as a serious solution, much more than uh, a solution actually, a livelihood in terms of what should happen within the higher uh, education sector. I would rather call it a bloodline to what uh, should happen. Unfortunately, uh, very recently, the government has also identified that uh, ICT, ICT would be a very big potential area in terms of developing the economy of the country. And that has uh, given us the chance to develop what uh, they would call Digital Ethiopia 2025 plan, a very comprehensive plan, 
whereby government is committing itself to every area of uh, digitalization as a move towards not increasing the research output and towards enhancing the higher education system, but towards uh, you know, national development and economic uh, development as well. So this is providing an additional chance, we hope, uh, in terms of uh, encouraging open access. Uh, very recent uh, sector specific policies like the ICT policy for higher education and TV8, which was uh, unveiled in 2020 and the specific uh, digital skills country action plan 2030 for higher education and TV8 institutions, again, built on the need for uh, putting up a uh, strong focus on building the required facilities and uh, moving into open uh, access. So we hope that this will be a very additional input to what Ethiopia uh, is uh, doing in terms of uh, open access. Uh, for your information, Ethiopia happens to be also the first country in terms of producing a national policy at ministerial level. And this happened in 2019. So government is dictating that every research uh, on which public money has been spent should be uh, openly accessible. And it has received uh, you know, lots of uh, acknowledgement uh, from many corners, including outside of uh, the, the region, uh, for being a country which has understood what it means uh, in terms of uh, what the potential of open access is. But although these are very promising uh, uh, things, uh, in, I mean, the creation of the enabling environment is very, very critical to what we are going to do in the future. There are many, many challenges, uh, as you must have seen in my way of, by way of uh, my description in terms of the achievements. And I think one major challenge we have is in terms of the lack of awareness and the specific strategies that institutions need to design because uh, having the resources, the infrastructure available would have meant a lot in terms of, you know, the institutions taking the chances and, and making sure that uh, this is for them. Uh, we have this uh, challenge of inadequate infrastructure, which you are aware of. Africa has to do a lot in terms of, you know, the unreliable power supplies we have, the slow and unstable connectivity, the low internet bandwidth, uh, issues of cost, which are uh, hindering, you know, developments in this area. Uh, for all this, also, we have this challenge of finance. Uh, challenges of capacities, human resource, the right, having the right type of human resource, having the right type of, you know, uh, data systems and, 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 and bases. But uh, with all the promising policies, I feel that uh, uh, countries like Ethiopia, if they have, they set their priorities properly, uh, they can, they can, uh, you know, uh, be a strong force uh, towards open science and they can also benefit a lot in terms of what open science can provide us. We understand that much remains in terms of uh, utilizing the potential of open science. Uh, we suggest that long-term strategies need to be uh, addressing these challenges. We also understand that as a person coming from the higher education sector, I also feel that higher education uh, institutions should be so proactive in terms of pushing, you know, the frontiers of uh, open science in terms of achievements and where we are. And uh, finally, uh, while sharing what Ania said about uh, the global dimension of uh, open science and the cooperation needed at all levels, uh, I also would like to emphasize that everything starts at home and uh, we need to do uh, what we are required to do at individual, institutional and regional level while thinking that this needs to be part of the global uh, moves that uh, Anya is suggesting and I'm supportive of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Budmunzen, for your for bringing uh, us to Ethiopia and and learning about uh, the the context and seeing at the same time many initiatives taking place and also, uh, of course, acknowledging some of the the challenges. And uh, there is there are not only challenges in, in Africa. I think that this is something that we see as well in the articles around the world that many of the authors are underlying underlining that. 
the road to open science is a very long one <laughs> and it takes time to get there, but uh, we need to continue the exchanges in terms of uh, solutions and of course, as you say, adapt to the, to the local context. And we need at the same time to move from uh, the level of the researchers, as Anya was saying, but also with uh, uh, national support from the government, as you were also referring to in, in your presentation. I think that many of the authors are also um, underlining the fact that we need a, a change of culture. And uh, for that, I would like now to turn to, um, to Canada and uh, um, introduce to you Matthew uh, Viss Dunbar. I hope that you have had the time to wake up. It's very early on your side. He is a librarian at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And in your article, you are also stressing the fact that there is a need uh, for a cultural change and you have been experimenting by trying to instill the values and principles of uh, open science in undergraduate uh, education. So we look forward to hearing from you, Matthew. Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, <clears throat> I will say I, I am here in part by virtue of an invitation a number of years ago um, by a faculty member uh, in biology at UBC on the Okanagan campus um, who approached the library and um, brought forward the issue that he was working with all these graduate students who were coming through. Um, and they were blissfully unaware of anything to do uh, with open science, anything to do with reproducibility, anything to do with, with how to make things open and accessible as part of the research process. Um, and talking about both things like inputs and outputs um, when we think about research. Um, <clears throat> and the, the goal really with, with what we were being approached with was, wouldn't it be ideal if our undergraduate students, when they graduated after their four year program, um, were practicing open science without thinking about it? They were practicing open science in the same way that when they walked into a lab, they were donning a lab coat and a set of goggles um, as just rote and procedure. Um, and that this was just part of doing really good science. And so when we think about open science in this context, we're really also just thinking about, it's about making it open, but it's also about doing really good research. Um, and I think originally we were, we were very much informed by this notion of, of reproducibility. Um, and so what is required in order to be able to take a scientific workflow um, and not only have somebody else understand what it is that you did, but thinking back yourself in two or three years, would I be able to understand what it is that I did? How did I get there? Why did I make the decisions that I made? And if we can start to articulate some of that context, moving that into open is really just a matter of unlocking that workflow and bringing it forward. So there was kind of like this parallel thing of doing really good, well-documented research, and then taking that key and opening that up and making it available to everybody. Um, I think since then we've really kind of expanded in terms of what we what we what we think about when we think about open science um, and thinking about it as this culture of practice. So not only the individuals that we engage with and how we engage with them, and that the notion of open might be different in these different situations, um, but also that this is just kind of that this just becomes part of the dialogue and part of the the continuity of the undertaking as we go through our studies. Um, and I think one of the reasons also that we really wanted to focus on, on uh, undergraduate education is that we, we noticed that a lot of the focus around open science was around researchers, graduate level students, individuals working with the government. Um, but we knew that our undergraduate students weren't necessarily all gonna end up as researchers, but they were gonna end up as engaged citizens. And we wanted these individuals to be in a situation where they had the theory, even if they weren't practicing science, they, they had the theory to be able to interpret and make well-founded evaluations and judgments about what they were being countered with. Um, and I think this has particular relevance when we think about things like climate change and we think about things like COVID and vaccines and our ability to be able to, as the general populace, to be able to make really thorough, educated, um, uh, approaches to looking at the evidence and how we evaluate that evidence and how we pull apart the pieces that produce that evidence and then the amount of trust that we put in that science which is being put forth. Um, in this process we have encountered a number of issues and I think so this was also kind of realizing at the same time that we had a number of individuals in biology who well actually across the university who were engaging in principles of open science in their classroom. 
part of what we were lacking though was this continuity through the program that would connect the pieces from year one through year four and have that final manifestation of donning those goggles and it just kind of being part of practice rather than a single point of engagement that is then maybe reinforced in one or two other classes but without that direct connection either between those classes and between those instructors. So when putting this together we've encountered a number of challenges at trying to do this at the programmatic level. I think the first one is how do you get into the classroom? So when we're looking at an undergraduate curriculum these classes are jam-packed with content. There is so much that these students need to learn. So the first thing we had to tackle was how do we get into the classroom? And then I'm not gonna suggest also that we have solutions for every, um, for every problem that we encountered or, or every challenge that we encountered. Um, the other piece that we had was how do we get these students using the tools that support reproducibility? So when we think about the software, when we think about the hardware, how do we get biology students um, using these tools when this is not a data science program. This is not a comp sci program. But we realized that if we're going to be asking individuals to be making their content open and accessible, that that content also needs to be legible for it to have any real world utility. So we can make our publication accessible. But if we can't interpret the prose, the fact that it is available online doesn't really help us that much. The same will go for the code and the scripts used in order to produce the findings that are in that manuscript. The other piece that we have is that there's the individual tools that allow for this reproducibility, but there's also those tools that allow for collaboration. And trying to engage our undergraduate students in using these tools that they will be expected to use when they go forward in, uh, in their graduate degrees and, and as practicing researchers. But that we end up in this really kind of weird support system within higher education, at least in our context, where we have tools built around teaching and learning, and we have tools built around research. And the tools built for teaching and learning are very about classroom, are very much about classroom management. And the ones about research are not about students. And we see kind of this, this undergraduate students engaged in research as kind of a niche thing, as opposed to the way in which we teach and learn in the classroom and research being fundamental to that teaching and learning engagement. Um, and then in the, in the Canadian context, in the context of the province of British Columbia, and then in the context of our, our own individual institution, we run into a number of barriers around when we think about things like security, or we think about privacy, and how some of these different infrastructures have been set up to support researchers, but not necessarily to support students, and what it is that we are and are not allowed to ask students to do when it comes to engaging with particular pieces of software. I think particularly in the context of Canada also is not, is not a huge country. When we think about software and hardware, which has been developed in order to support research, um, a lot of the infrastructure is going through international servers. It is going through servers that sit in the United States. Um, and this has a huge limiting capacity when we think about what it is that we're allowed to ask our students to engage with in terms of where their information is going and where that information is, is is, is, is passing through. And so even with the best of intentions for having our students engage in some of these activities, we hit these jurisdictional and policy, um, what, what do you call them? These walls <laughs> that really limit our capacity to engage in some of these tools in the undergraduate classroom. Um, and I think part of this as well is really that balance also between, we want to engage these students with the theory as well as the practical aspects of working in open science. And I think this goes back to this notion of not all of these students are gonna become researchers. And when they graduate, it's, that, it's gonna be that theory piece that really kind of pushes them forward um, and pushes society forward in terms of that change of culture and the way that we engage with science, the way that we trust with science, even if we are not the practitioners of science itself. And then I think the final piece really, which is, which is, which I, which I think is, is, um, um, and I wouldn't necessarily say that this is, um, the biggest challenge, but it is definitely a large hurdle to, 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 to come over is that, is that looking at this from a programmatic level, I think a lot of these things we can introduce within an individual classroom. There are so many resources out there for the activities that we can engage in, um, the software solutions that we can use in an individual classroom to overcome this, but looking at this as a implementation across an entire program where we have discrete connections for those students who enter in year one to perhaps a final project in year four that brings all of these pieces together that have been scaffolded over those four years is we need buy-in from the entire department 
we need to have everybody on board, everybody working together. We need access to labs, to assignments, to lecture materials, to ensure that we can make these discrete connections and tie these pieces together. Um, I, I, so I think we, we, we have, we, we, we've been at this now for uh, about three years. Um, we are, we're, we're, we're making headway. Um, we still have a long ways to go. Um, I, the, the, uh, we had difficulty identifying other individuals who had tackled this at a programmatic level. Um, I did, um, I was attending a webinar series put on by TIER and chanced upon somebody at Glasgow in the psychology department who it looks has undertaken something very similar. Um, but this is also if there are people out there who are working on similar initiatives and uh, you simply have not produced a publication or posted about this anywhere, um, and you have found solutions to any of these issues, I would definitely be interested in hearing. Um, and I think we can also, if there are questions about any of the specifics in terms of how this was tackled, um, I'd be happy to address those as part of, a, as part of the uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew, for, for sharing your experience and uh, um, showing how you've been trying to get the, 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 this change of culture uh, into the, the, the undergraduate uh, um, program as well uh, in order to, because as you were saying, that is our, the, the, the future is the, the youth of today. So we, um, we definitely need to, to look at that perspective as well, as well as some of the constraints, some of the um, incompatibilities between different structures that we have. Um, so it is um, very good to learn from, from this experience. I am now pleased to return to Fernanda, uh, who is also uh, mentioning several very important aspects in, in the article that she is uh, contributed to IAU Horizons. Among others, some of the asymmetries between countries uh, in terms of the current uh, research uh, ecosystem and suggestions about how the open science movement can contribute to, to, to um, disrupt these uh, asymmetries, uh, maybe. So, Fernanda, we look forward to hearing from you again, uh, uh, this time on your article. Thank you very much, Trini, and maybe in some insights from Latin America, I was really very pleased to listen to the situation in Ethiopia and to students in, in, in what Matthew was referring, because in the first draft of the text for the recommendation, there was a list of actors and the students were not there. And so it was very interesting that we took the inputs from some of the state members that, that mentioned this very big issue that students have to be there and, and they, they uh, have a, a new and very interesting place in the second draft and they were, that was approved, of course. And uh, also in relation with what Anya was saying, because she was also very worried about the research assessment systems, in, in my intervention in this dossier, what I would very briefly try to, to to tell you in, in this five or six minutes is that in the definition of open science that at the end is one of the main, main objectives or the goals of this recommendation to try to, to, to achieve a global consensus on the definition of on a movement that it is in progress and, and in, in permanent transformation because it's something relatively new is that we have, as you can see here, maybe three, six, seven, and maybe more uh, aspects of open science that you've all referred, of course, uh, in your different interventions. And all of these different sides of open science have risks and also forces that tend to what the dossier was entitled or called, which is how to advance on an open science in a closed world, because there are many forces that tend to close doors on, on these issues. For example, on open data or, or open access, we know that we have very important forces and especially I would like to mention mercantilization and the, the role played by the, the big oligopolies that we have in, in, in the publishing enterprises. We also have the impact factor that was already mentioned and the university rankings that have played a really, really nocive uh, role here in, in converting all our uh, process of, re of uh, scientific research in uh, committed to only one result, which is the published results in these type of journals with uh, impact factor and with 
or within the, the rankings of, of journals uh, globally. And this has been also implemented not only in the North or in the centers of excellence as, as um, they were called in the, by the classics. I can see that uh, Philippe Alpach is here and he's part of, of the critique to this type of, um, of, uh, of academic system. But what I see is that these uh, forces that have tended to, to closure and to, to mercantilization also assume that there, there can be one global science, one universal science. And uh, what open science is aiming to is not to one global science, but and not to, to incentive the homogeneity, but diversity. And so we have to speak also about the relationship between the global standards, the global tendencies and processes and the conversation, and also the local needs. And so I think that in, in, in these uh, five or six aspects of open science, we have risks and we have forces tending to closure. In Latin America, for example, we have research assessment systems which are completely uh, co concentrated in, in measuring the impact factor, but we also have other situations. For example, in Argentina, the social sciences and humanities are measured in our research uh, agency, the CONICET, with a particular type of indicators. And so I'm going to take now the proposal by Ismail Rafos, who says that, as you can see in the, in the right hand of this, uh, uh, of this, I don't know, I don't re not remember in English the word for this uh, <laughs> thing that I have there. And he says we, we need indicators to for research assessment that can be contextualized, that can be di di diversified, and that are plural in order to mm, be able to measure really, and not only quantitatively, of course, also qualitatively, the situations that we have in the context that we are really producing science. And so I would like to say that in this case, we have to, in this case or in any case, we, we do understand that the, the, the critical role of incentives for open science, if we don't change the reward system, it's very difficult to find changes in the practices and the scientific practices of our colleagues, students and, and researchers. And so finally, I would like to say that there is a, a certain consensus among the experts in scientific policy that the most effective path to produce changes in the production, but also in the circulation of knowledge is to change the reward systems. Of course, we have to implement a qualitative shift and adopt localized criteria also. And uh, we depend in that sense a lot on the autonomy of the governance at the level of the institutions. There is always like um, an equilibrium that exists and a, a margin for maneuver that exists in each country, in each institution. And we have to use this um, broad possibilities that we have and sometimes we don't we think we don't have because our universities are only uh, thinking on, on, on being in a better place in the top 10 of, of an university ranking right so we think that I think that a new deal between global national and local standards should be pushed and the recommendation for open science in progress within UNESCO precisely addresses these tensions. And I think it seeks to pave the road. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fernanda, for, for sharing this with you, uh, with us as well, because I think that this is uh, linked to this change of, of culture that is required if, if we want. I mean, you're referring to change of reward systems, uh, change a new deal. So um, it is not just simple. We know that cultural change takes time, but this is are some of the if, if things that we definitely need to be aware of as we move forward. I forgot to insist, of course, to the audience that you're very welcome to pose any questions in the chat. Uh, we are about to turn to the, the Q&A, so if you have not already posted your question, please uh, go ahead now. Uh, and I am pleased to hand over the, the floor to uh, Gerardo uh, um, um, from the Center of International Higher Education to, to lead this uh, question and answer sessions with you. Gerardo, you Thank have you. the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Trina, for, uh, for that introduction. Happy to uh, facilitate this portion of our webinar. So thank you for those of you who have been posting and sending some of these questions. I think we can begin 
with one that seems very uh, pressing, an issue that I think is very, uh, very connected with what Fernanda was just discussing a moment ago, which is um, obviously this uh, open science movement has many challenges, right? There are certain obstacles. One of them uh, comes, uh, one of the questions comes from Ryan Allen and, and he's asking, that one of the, well, he's stating one of the biggest challenges or threats comes from predatory publishing. Um, what can be done, right? In what ways uh, can we be challenging some of the predatory tactics uh, that some uh, publications have and how can we combat uh, this, this threat or reduce it? Uh, I think this can be answered by any of our panelists. Um, um, as, um... This sometimes is really um, put very prominently um, in some of the media, and, and it's, it's sort of easy, maybe fear a little bit uh, or reluctance of researchers to, to enter this area of open science publishing. And of course, uh, instruments like the, uh, the DOIJ um, and other instruments that help um, uh, assess the quality. Um, of, um, of journals will help. Um, perhaps we do not, uh, we will not be able to uh, uh, eliminate this, um, this, this category of predatory journals, um, but we will be able to do uh, something about that. The other, the other thing might also be um, not only to highlight uh, the threat of predatory journals, but also of, of um, um, not so helpful practices quality of the status journal. Um, and sometimes in, in, in the newspapers in the Netherlands, there are articles about things that go wrong um, in, in the very high esteem journal. So that puts, that puts it a little bit in balance. So. Thank you. If, if I may share our limited experiences, Shall I? Please go ahead, yes. Yeah, uh, predatory publications are a serious uh, threats uh, in terms of the developments we're uh, talking about, yes. Uh, but within the Ethiopian higher education system, uh, the first thing uh, we look at uh, uh, predatory publications has been lately a point of discussion among the sector uh, stakeholders and representatives. And uh, what has been done is to define what these are in the first place and to uh, somehow develop a mechanism whereby uh, all stakeholders, important stakeholders are involved uh, in terms of preventing them. So very lately, the government, the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and Higher Education has lately developed uh, uh, guidelines and the specific ways of identifying predatory publications. This is always a problem, I know. It may not be 100% proof, but there are two fronts that the Ministry of Science and Higher Education has addressed. And the first one is uh, to look at current sources uh, whereby, uh, you know, the available, the list of journals is considered to be trusted to, to some extent. So they have chosen, for instance, the Web of Science and the Scopus, uh, where, I mean, journals listed in those uh, specific uh, uh, <coughs> platforms will be regarded as, uh, you know, acceptable journals, acceptable publications. But provided that uh, government also checks on, universities also check on the current list uh, issued by Web of Science and the Scopus, because they provide those types of lists. Uh, every now and then. The second uh, strategy designed by the ministry is uh, a system whereby local journals, accredited local journals, are encouraged as platforms. So in, in, in consultation with the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences, for instance, there has been a system whereby local journals are supposed to apply and get accredited for the quality of work based on transparent criteria. I think this is annually done, uh, which would somehow uh, you know, provide the opportunity that uh, people have to be uh, aware of where they are publishing and how they are publishing. 
The third strategy uh, related to this is <clears throat> there is a current scheme to provide awareness training, especially to young researchers who have to be aware of uh, what it means to publish, to get published in print data journals, what that means in terms of their career. So the, the, the issue uh, is uh, somehow, uh, it has become an issue, a serious issue and defining the concept and how we prevent it and continuously engaging in this process is one major area. Related to the open science uh, movements that uh, the sector is uh, capitalizing on, we rather regard the open science movement as one of the mechanisms of solving the, you know, the problem of predatory, predatory publications. We feel that uh, the fact that these are regis, I mean, these are, there are repositories where most researchers come in uh, in a manner uh, that would be, you know, uh, observable, that would be, you know, studied. We feel that that would provide an additional chance to check whether it's up to the standard defined by the system or not. So though uh, open science is supposed to, you know, encourage uh, these uh, elements of predatory publications. On the other side of it, uh, the fact that things are accessible in an open form, in a very transparent form, would also provide the opportunity for anyone else who would like to go in, check and uh, see whether those are up to the standards defined, defined in a system. It's a difficult task, but uh, uh, we will have uh, to deal with it in a very continuous, engaged and cooperative manner. Thank you. Thank you very I much. Like to say something, if I can, Gerardo, it's not. Yes, please, please go ahead. Yes. Just a little thing that I think that one of the main issues of predatory journals have to do with the, the industry of prestige that is around the publishing system and all these um, journals that normally have been within the big and mainstream databases, such as Scopus or Web of Science. Uh, today, of course, is Clarivate. But this was, uh, was pushed because of the fact that these journals do gain something in the process. And in the process of open science or open access, many journals have passed to what we call the article processing charges. And these article processing charges are an invitation to continue this uh, um, type of mercantile type of publishing. And it, it is an incentive for these predatory journals. So the recommendation of open science for open science at UNESCO includes explicitly a prevention against APC. That's just what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Thank you, Fernanda. And actually, that's a perfect segue for a follow-up question that is not in the chat, but uh, that was sent direct, as a direct message, which I think is very uh, important, which is the notion that open science, of course, uh, involves a change, right, in the business model, right? There is an entire industry of publication. And of course, uh, open science requires a change in paradigm uh, which implies, of course, a disruption. So I wonder if uh, any of our panelists may want to, to comment on how can we plan for that transition in a way that is sustainable, right? Because uh, after all, there is an, an entire industry that uh, needs to, in a way, function or transition out. And, and I think that's sometimes one of the obstacles. And it seems that some of the solutions that we uh, discuss in open science in a way, circle back to some of these problems in a way they become kind of dead ends as well. And we end up reconstructing some systems. Uh, Fernanda, as you had mentioned, the fee system is a really good example of that. Uh, it, we kind of go back to certain practices because there are some real challenges that we need to be uh, grappling with. So I would invite commentary for uh, from any or all of our panelists here. I think so. Th this is not a, a a direct answer to that question. I don't think, but it does it it does leverage and reflect back on the previous question as well. And I think that like when we think about the um, the domain of scholarly communication and predatory uh, publishing and how that intersects with open science, I think it goes back to a lot of the conversation around changing the metrics of evaluation that we use. Um, and so one of the reasons that we have predatory publishing 
publishing is a consequence of the fact that individuals need to publish to advance their careers. Um, and if we shift what it is that we are evaluating individuals on, and we look at there is equal value in all stages of the research process and all the inputs that then manifest in that output, um, and the ways that we provide access to those, the venues that we provide access to, uh, to those and how we evaluate those as intrinsic objects, but also has, as they relate to career progression. Um, I think that starts to, that starts to shift the the way that we engage in research and the reason why some of this predatory publishing is existing. Now, obviously it does, I think, as you said, as you suggest, it opens up other avenues for these same kinds of activities to, 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 to proliferate, um, not just then in the context of, of, of manuscripts, but in the context of whether it's code, whether it's data, whether it is any other piece of the research process. Um, but I do think like in conjunction with all the other work that governments do, that libraries do in order to, um, uh, uh, provide easier ways for um, researchers to find the most reputable publishers. I think also looking at what, what are these metrics of measure and how can we shift that and what, what, what can that do to, 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 to alter the role of predatory publishing in the context of research. Ania, please go ahead, yes. And it's the, 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 the metrics and the reward systems are crucial. What we're doing in Utrecht University right now is we have just proposed to the board of the university to implement open access policy where we ask the university and we will implement that to move away gradually from the big contracts with the publishers to put less money in the contracts because we pay through our contracts right now in the Netherlands, we pay for open access. Some years ago, we said, we want to pay you the same amount of money, but we require open access for the Dutch publication. Well, we reached a level where 80% of open access is, is, is going through the published contracts. But we now think we need to free up money to put in alternative publishing platforms, for example to provide alternatives for authors to publish in line with the change that the reward system um, uh, we hope um, will see um, um, so that the, the reward change and system change and also there will be available new ways on, on, on collaborative um, publishing platforms in the public um, domain to publish. Um, that's experimental, but that's the way we're moving now. The other thing that we have asked and we will be working on is to provide permanent funding in university for open access publishing. So not just an incentive fund or some help or looking at the research funders, but also asking the university to implement a funding system for open access publishing. Well, that's going to be a, a different, difficult one, but we, we really want to start the discussion about that. I, I think uh, to, to add a few points, uh, the kind of, we have to be sure about the kind of transition that we're talking about. Uh, I think we understand that the transition process would definitely be gradual. I think there are exceptions to the transition process because uh, as, as said earlier on, there is this issue, this issue of privacy, this issue of security, which sometimes will have uh, to deter, uh, you know, our moves to open access. So with all those exceptions and the considerations, uh, I think uh, one way of uh, uh, ad uh, addressing the challenges requires, uh, first of all, having a full conviction about the benefits of open access as compared to the possible challenges that we might have. I think this uh, issue of awareness is a serious issue. If you look at the context in Ethiopia, for instance, where government has gone uh, way ahead in terms of creating uh, structures, in terms of creating policies, right policies, 
uh, one would assume that uh, things would move smoothly, but that has not been the case. Why is it that researchers are not ready to provide, you know, their uh, their uh, outputs? Why is it that uh, institutions have not been forthcoming in terms of developing strategies? So there is this misunderstanding, uh, you know, wrong conceptualization about the open access uh, movement. And changing uh, the mindset and creating the right awareness is a huge, uh, it, it looks very simple, but uh, it's a huge uh, amount of uh, challenge that we will have to handle uh, at first. And eventually, uh, as uh, all the panelists have clearly pointed out, issues of uh, technological issues and political issues, economic issues, uh, organizational issues, and all those issues uh, will have uh, to be sorted out uh, in an organized manner, but there will always be challenging as we go along and we need to be uh, resolute enough to, to, you know, to face those challenges and find ways of addressing them every new uh, intervention and every new you know uh, development has uh, this uh, nature and uh, with regard to the benefits it's more important to face the challenges of open access than uh, you know to be a little bit inhibitive about what would come uh, what would take us uh, back uh, so that's what what i would suggest in terms of the strategies that uh, we we have to think of I think one of the consequences of some of these latest round of comments is that indeed uh, that transition and cultural change needs to begin early on. I thought like Matthew's comments about incorporating some of these notions in the undergraduate curriculum was very important. But I am wondering if our panelists know of perhaps any other initiatives to even begin earlier than that, uh, perhaps with some of the uh, uh, different approaches that we could have to open science even before uh, university or tertiary education. I, I think sometimes we lose that perspective and it can be very valuable when we are thinking of sustainable and sustained transitions. I can only comment to say that I don't know that I do. <laughs> um, I have been, so over the years, I've been made aware of individual, like of initiatives around like um, things like how to read code and reading code as like a narrative um, as ways of getting um, uh, elementary and high school students engaged in this process of how do we communicate this clearly? Um, but it is, yeah, I, I will stop there because outside of that, this is, uh, it's beyond my area of expertise. <laughs> researchers currently in the Netherlands, I think, um, to PhDs, master students, undergraduate students, but it's, it's all in the beginning. So. Uh, so we, we're still pretty much on the, on the level of researchers. Public libraries, um, of course, focus on digital literacy. So they might, uh, we're, we're, we're looking to um, have our training program uh, with regards to digital literacy to be connected to what public libraries are offering or school or is offered in schools. So that way we try to make a connection, but that's that's all I can think of. Uh, I, I don't uh, know specific in initiatives related to schools, but in terms of uh, policies, what the government has come up with, uh, the digital skills policies, it's a very comprehensive plan which starts from the lower levels of education and uh, you know, in, in wishes to encourage the availability of materials, uh, capacity building in terms of uh, offering training to school teachers, researchers, and everybody who can uh, participate in the uh, whole uh, elements of what comes out through uh, digital uh, skills and uh, digitalization. Uh, and the government has also had uh, this uh, specific uh, plan of uh, school net, they call it school net. And one of the reasons why the school net was uh, started in Ethiopia earlier on, at the beginning of the 2000s, 
uh, was to create resources, to create uh, mechanisms whereby people are shared from one region to another region where you have uh, less capacity in terms of human resource and infrastructure. So I think, uh, though I am not uh, sure of the specific initiatives, uh, the fact that the, the policy framework includes all levels of education indicates the thinking behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think to stay with the uh, topic and the theme of uh, policies, uh, one of the questions through the, through the chat is returning to these ethical frameworks and ethical practices, even some of the challenges that you all have been referring to around privacy, perhaps, and other issues related with ethics. Uh, what governance uh, and accountability structures are we uh, keeping here in mind? Obviously, you all represent different regions, uh, which will have different approaches to policies. But uh, what do you see as promising practices or at least policy considerations as we continue moving into an open science uh, paradigm? I think one of the important things to, to advance in that path, because it's really a, a path that is not advanced at all in general, the, the accountability and the, the norms for, for the governance in, in many of the aspects of open science has to do with the countries that have uh, passed the national law on open science. And in, in Latin America, we have three countries that have passed the national law and that gives you a, like a general normative uh, uh, context. For example, in Argentina, we have uh, the, the instrument for the application of all the open access uh, norms and, and procedures are in the hands of the national repository system and the, the Ministry of um, Science and Technology. And there, we are advancing on in handbooks for good practices in all of these matters. And we have founded recently a national uh, open science committee that is working on the diagnosis and the general policies that should be applied with, of course, these uh, elements of governance taken into account. Uh, if I may share the Ethiopian experience, in, in terms of governance, uh, especially the new policies, define what the role of the Ministry of Science and Higher Education is and what the role of the universities, and specifically <coughs> the roles of researchers have been also <coughs> uh, offering. Uh, for instance, if you look at the uh, role of the Ministry of Science and Higher Education, it has to support the National Academic Digital Repository of Ethiopia because this is considered as the aggregated national reposit repository for, for publication at, at a national level. Equally, <coughs> universities have to develop their institutional repositories. They have to be willing to be part of the national uh, repository and they have also to uh, be active enough in terms of uh, promoting open science among uh, their academic uh, community. They have to inform and advise authors about the various options that they have. Uh, <clears throat> university libraries are also have, uh, they have to make resources available and uh, the institutional repositories developed at college or faculty, or whichever level you may, you may think of, have to be also supported by universities uh, overall, the practices and, and infrastructures that are meant to be developed at the institutional level have got to be supported and uh, <clears throat> promoted both at the university and, and the Ministry of Science and Higher Education. Uh, the Ministry of Higher Science and Higher Education also claims that in terms of accountability, any, any type of research assessment done at the institutional level, at the university level, uh, will have uh, to ensure that uh, they have uh, uh, properly, <clears throat> uh, you know, followed the open science uh, policy framework that has been created. Uh, but how much this has been checked on, how much the monitoring and evaluation uh, is going on is a serious gap. And we need to capitalize on that because in terms of achievements, we see that despite the creation of the structures that I said and the, the policy, the achievements are, uh, I mean, leave yet much, much to be desired. 
So those frameworks, ethical frameworks, the accountability frameworks will have to be uh, sorted out, you know, will have to be discussed and will have to be, will have to be communicated widely among the uh, pertinent community. Thank you very much. Uh, Matthew, did you want to add to this, uh, to this uh, question? Yeah, I was just gonna. I was just gonna echo on that um, on the piece that I think one of the things that that the policy does is it helps to routinize and normalize some of this. I think one of the issues that we often encounter though is that the policy uh, it, it, it instructs what one should do, but not how one should do it. And then you have the institution scrambling with how are we going to um, implement the policy. And then I think the big piece, which is often then left out of that, which um, which which. Uh, I think often has us then with this policy, these haphazard solutions which have been scrambled together. And then you miss this education and training piece. And the education and training piece is so crucial for the solutions to be used. Um, and I think it's, I know that we definitely encounter this um, in the Canadian landscape and at UBC is how do we how do we promote and how do we train the services that we've put in place in order to in order to address some of these um, uh, these policies and to offer solutions to our researchers and to our students. So connecting, uh, oh, Anya, please, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, the question, uh, there are different elements. Um, what we're trying to do, we still have to do that to um, um, try and get open access science principles in the ethical code of the universities, because there is an ethical code which um, addresses plagiarism, for example, reproducibility, transparency of data, et cetera. So we want to open, open science principles in there. That discussion we need to start as on a national level. We only have 14 universities, so but they will do that. We have a law, an IP law, that has been changed in the Netherlands that says that any author, is uh, academic author, uh, author, is entitled to uh, publish its, um, uh, its, uh, his or her article that after a reasonable time after publishing with a publisher, we're, we're, we're working with that. Um, and there's also, like I think, uh, Will, Will, Will Rosen said, um, we have a research assessment system um, for research that a framework that is used that now has incorporated open science principles. So there's different areas to work in. Also, of course, we, we want the European Union to help with that. And that has, we have not succeeded um, in all um, in all areas, <laughs> with that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very hard to believe, but we are five minutes from the end of our allotted time. So this is the moment where I will turn it back to Trina uh, to to begin wrapping up our session. Thank you very much, uh, Gerardo, and and thank you first of all to to all of the panelists uh, who took part in in this debate, and uh, thank you uh, to the audience for joining. I think that it has been a very interesting uh, discussion, showing uh, positive movements, things that are advancing, but also highlighting many of the the challenges ahead. And I think that Matthew framed it very nicely saying that we need at the same time policy that is supportive, but we certainly need the universities to propose solutions that are sustainable and that, that, that works for the, for the community. So, so there is, um, it is still a long road ahead, but I think that we have to continue these uh, international dialogues. Uh, and of course, as was also uh, stressed by uh, Wood Wunsen and by Fernanda, it has to be um, anchored in the local context, of course, and we need to have these different um, um, multiplicity of systems coming together through dialogue so that we can also use this opportunity of bringing more international uh, engagement uh, together in, in, in research. So I think that um, I, will, I will end with that. It's, uh, it is uh, not a, a simple way forward, but I hope that uh, 
the, the commitment that we see through the normative instrument coming from UNESCO is one that hopefully will lead um, to more commitment at the national level. And then we also see the movement uh, at the level of the universities across the different articles in our magazine. So I also invite you all to, to go and discover uh, the other articles um, in that one. And then finally, I would like to invite you, of course, to consider participating in our um, next webinar at IAU. The next one is on the changing mission of universities over time, taking place uh, Tuesday next week. But we are also very pleased to already announce our next uh, co-organized uh, webinar with the Center of International Higher Education, which will take place on the 15th of June on family-owned universities. So I think that is it for me. I don't know if you, Gerardo or Hans, you want to add anything on your end. Uh, otherwise, I would like to, to thank you all for your participation and we look forward to continuing the debate uh, beyond this webinar. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>